will uh, get people. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the FRCS teaching from the FRCS mentor group. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, tonight we have uh, the pleasure of having two candidates who recently passed the FRCS successfully. Um, they were members of uh, of this group who attended our teaching and um, um, they have a lot of um, experience of the exam they're gonna tell us about uh, tonight. Um, we have other mentors also here, Fuad, Abdullah, uh, uh, Pranshu, and uh, Shwan uh, joining shortly. And I myself, I'm Firas, also one of the mentors. So uh, please, there will be mainly um, exam experience here. So I'm sure a lot of you will have some questions. So please raise your hand symbol next to your name if you want to ask um, our presenters any question and I will put you through. There will also be a couple of viva questions towards the end from Anshul, who is gonna uh, present a couple of cases he will ask you um, uh, viva, viva you about it and then tell you what's the ideal answer. So please stick into the end. Uh, again, any questions, raise the hand symbol next to your name or write in the chat box. Um, and uh, we'll try to help you out. So um, without uh, further ado, I'll put, as I said, he's passed the FRCS uh, only a few days ago. <laughs> um, but, uh, and that's the ideal person to present today because everything is fresh and um, he, you know, you can't get any better than this. And he is an orthopedic surgeon, obviously. He works in London. So over to you, Ashish. Yes, yeah. we can see you now. Get, get, get. Thank you, Firas. Uh, first of all, to start with, I would like to definitely thank all the mentors on this group uh, because of which uh, I found uh, it very helpful to pass in my first attempt. So thank you very much, Firas, Shwan, and mm -hmm. all the mentors on this group. Um, well done. I would well like done. to I think, share I think, my yeah. experience of the exam. So. Uh, FRCS part two, I said, how did I do it? Because I would like to say that this is not the only way of doing it. And this is definitely like, I'm, I'm not aware what are the standards set by the Royal College for passing the exam, but this is the conclusion of my own experience that these are the things which helped me pass it in the first attempt. So I will say it again, this is not the only way of doing it. Everyone is different. I will have my own strengths. I will have my weaknesses. So everyone will have them. So you will have to tailor it according to your needs. But this is the conclusion of what I feel, okay, these all things help me get it through, right? So first talking about the preparation, one thing which I feel is that you should have adequate experience preferably in the UK, like this is not for people giving the international FRCS, but if you are in the UK, I feel that you, you need to work at a registrar level for at least three to four years. In my personal experience, people will have different views, but that much time I feel is needed to get a hang of how NHS works, what is the level expected, and also in general, it gives you a confidence of talking to people, talking to colleagues, and in general, how referral system works, how uh, like uh, a level one trauma center will take or a tumor center will take patients, uh, what to do with the metastatic cord compression. So all those things can be found in the books, but if you have worked and you have dealt with those patients, it is much less, like much easier. So I came into UK in uh, end of 2013. Initially, I was like, okay, I need to give the exam. But then I thought that it will be too stressful. So I waited for about three and a half years, four years to apply for it. And that gave me the opportunity to work in all the subspecialties in orthopedics except pediatrics. And that was the only thing I was very scared in the exam that I should not have a intermediate case of cerebral palsy or I should not have 
any pediatric case in my clinical exam. That's what I was hoping. So that definitely makes a difference. Uh, like if you have not worked in a subspeciality, that will be definitely your weak point. Like people are often scared of spine cases. I had worked six months in spine and like I was lucky to have a, a consultant who used to show me how he examines all the patients. I used to just stand instead of he saying, okay, you examine, I will tell you what is wrong. He used to examine like an exam candidate and I used to observe him. So towards the end, like I was so confident with spying saying, okay, I'll be very, very happy if they gave me a spine case. So I think it makes a lot of difference. Like uh, if you have spent six months in the subspeciality. So if you were to spend in all subspecialities, you do need about three, three and a half years to be minimum. And similarly with level one trauma center experience, if you have had that, then it is much less stressful to answer all these uh, high velocity pelvic traumas, chest injuries, or spine trauma questions, than to just read it from the book and then like to just re reproduce the answer. So that's my personal opinion that if possible, then you should give adequate time for uh, having an adequate registrar experience in the UK. You can definitely do it much before than that, but you might have to put in three to five times more effort for the same. That's my personal opinion. Now, once you've decided to give it, then I would say to start early. Uh, like I have given part one and part two with a long gap. Like I had given part one just so that I start reading at least. But then there was a gap of about 14, 15 months between the two parts in my case. So I took it easy after part one. I passed it uh, in November 2017. Didn't do anything till I think August of 18. But then I started reading seriously from September of 18 for my April exam. So that means like I had a good eight months in my hand for seven, for part two. So I think at least six months is minimum I feel from my experience that six months for part two is a must. Eight months gave me a good, good time in hand so that I could finish one reading in six months and then revise everything in the last couple of months. So must start early. And as you would have heard everyone say, find a study group, find a study group. I was lucky. Um, I had another couple of people appearing from my same hospital. So we were able to start uh, FRCS teaching with a very senior consultant here. Every Tuesday, he used to have Viva sessions for us very experienced person. And then we were also able to sit down uh, and uh, discuss uh, clinical cases or viva scenarios or, or on the weekends or in between like in theaters. So that makes a lot of difference. So ideally three people, but if not two is, two is also enough. I feel like we had like the third person was not very active. So I think it, it's equally good if you have two people who are very serious about it. Like you both have to have the same passion, enthusiasm that, okay, fine. After working for eight to eight, that you can still sit and discuss for a couple of hours. So that's one thing which I found helpful. Books, again, uh, a lot of people would have told you, I would, again, this is very personal. I feel like what I felt that these were the right books which helped me pass. This might be a bit different from other people would have told you. I just have a few slides of the books that were the main books that helped me. And courses, uh, what I found is that uh, people said that, oh, I'm on the waiting list for that course or oh, I didn't get course because that was full. So I think good courses will go early. So you need to start early. I started like sending emails to the secretaries or the persons who had uh, arranged a good course last year. As soon as I started, like September, my focus was not on the book, but to send emails to people that, oh, when is the next year's course? I am appearing in April. Can you please tell me the date? So even before they were like the dates were decided or like uh, to advertise it is far, far away. Like they said that we have not yet decided what date we are going to conduct it. My email was with them that please put me on the waiting list. So any good course will go much in advance, like six months very easily. So I will, I will let you know my courses as well, but 
most of those courses i had booked well in advance six months in advance for the last three courses especially i did so i let you know so this everyone would have seen these are the pillars of anybody preparing for uh, the frcs this the first book i just love it i uh, like this is given just right level and just the right amount for uh, the frcs exam like i literally love that book i want to literally see the author and thank him this is the level i love that book so very concise just the right level and the way it is asked that's very very important like they will ask you or they would have given scenario which is the way i was asked so i think the best and the best book was the the postgraduate orthopedic blue book and similarly viva's book was good but uh, i could not get a chance to revise it it's given uh, nicely about viva stations but some of it is covered by the blue book itself and i had 6 month 6 weeks in the end to revise stuff so i could not revise it to that detail extent but i still remembered most of it from my first reading and nick harris book i think most of the people use uh, it's not necessary that you read through it but uh, i think i just use it uh, to pass through the pictures to see uh, how a test is done and i think that again is was very very helpful now different section uh, book uh, this is something which people might or might not agree uh, ramachandran i read it for 6 weeks in my peak time in february i didn't like it at all like it is given in too much of detail and uh, i am a kind of person if something is in front of me i tend to try to learn it or just keep in mind so there were quite a lot of stuff which was not needed i believe so in the end what happened is i if you try to memorize everything you will not remember anything so after spending good 6 weeks the amount i retained from ramachandran was about 30 to 40% i believe so i decided to ditch it in the last 6 weeks so i read only the the beniskovich book has about 125 pages of basic sciences i had not read them before so but it was very stressful but in last 6 days to my exam i read those 125 pages and i then went to ram uh, this ramachandran book they it has given like questions in the end what viva questions had come so i just passed through the pages i said whichever question is covered by the beniskovich book i'm not going to touch that anything which was not covered in those 125 pages of beniskovich i read through ramachandran though i would say it is a good book as a reference if i was to suggest it like to a friend or a brother i would say that i would read the 125 pages of beniskovich some places it is too concise you don't understand what he is talking so those places you can definitely go and read from ramachandran but all in all if you are reading you have to know what level you need like in everything he has given complications in everything uh, he has given too far of a detail as per my opinion again people can differ but uh, like for example in processes in processes like there are different like obviously a processes will have four components the uh, the what he has done is that he has given details of the suspension and what can be the complications and benefit of each type of suspension in the processes which is not expected i believe like i was asked that question but i was just asked to name the headings of different types of suspensions like a belt type or a suction type or an anatomical type not what can be the complication of a belt type or a disadvantage of a suction type so uh, personally i feel that the the level given is a bit too far in detail so if i was in a uh, like in a mood of reading beniskovich in which it is given quite concisely so i used to read beniskovich and try to remember the most important points which was i found it very difficult with ramachandran even in 6 weeks similarly as when i started my preparation in september i like think oh you should read the biggest book possible and then i started with this post graduate pediatric orthopedic book just because as i said i had not done pediatric so i thought this will make it up but again unless you can 
revise what you have read in the last six weeks. I think no one is a computer to remember everything. Whatever you will read, only 50% remains after a few weeks. You have to revise all the stuff in the last six weeks to the exam. So unless you can revise in the last six weeks, you would not be able to reproduce most of the stuff you have read beyond two months. So I did read it in September for about three, four weeks, but I did not have the time to read it in the last six weeks. So again, I switched to Beniskovic. Beniskovic has pediatric sections and I read only that. And fortunately, I didn't have any problems with that. In addition to these books, the resources, obviously everyone is aware, OrthoBullets is a very, very good resource. Uh, I would use it in addition to any of the previous primary books, Beniskovic, if you read something in which he's not given in detail or you don't uh, get, okay, what he's saying or you don't make any concept out of it, then you can definitely go to OrthoBullets, have a read through OrthoBullets to just understand what Beniskovic is trying to stay, like say, and then you won't need to come back to OrthoBullets in the last six weeks. So use it as a reference, uh, like anything which you don't understand. And uh, some trauma topics, I believe, like uh, Beniskovic has not given trauma much in detail in any way. So if you feel that some trauma topics, you are finding it a bit difficult or hard, then definitely you can refer to OrthoBullets. Images are so nice, like the Judith views and those things. Uh, it's much easier if you see an X-ray image, which OrthoBullets has given nicely. And obviously anyone who's here is aware of the FRCS mentor group on YouTube. And um, Abdullah had suggested after uh, his passing about physio tutors, I did use that. I found it helpful to see uh, some tests which you don't know like how to do it. Different books give it differently. So I did use physio tutors which I found helpful. Courses, uh, I booked these five courses. Uh, the first two courses uh, I booked much uh, earlier in my preparation, uh, there, all of them were very, very good courses like uh, the Orupedes course, a very, very nice course. The first day was focused on Viva stations and second day they had, I believe, 16 clinical cases. And like those who have not done PEDS, this is a very, very good course for them to see some actual pediatric cases. Viva again, like uh, it gives you a good practice for talking about PEDS cases in Viva. Very experienced faculty as well. So I will say it was a very, very nice course organized in Evelina uh, Hospital in London. Spine, Oruk Spine again, very, very nice course uh, organized in Stanmore. Uh, I met Abdullah in that course. I, I, I think Abdullah was there in both the courses. So a uh, very nice course, uh, very nicely organized and good clinical cases. I think towards the end, I thought like, why, why I can anytime talk, but it's the clinical cases which you need to see. So if someone is showing you good 10, 12, 15 clinical cases, that course is definitely worth giving lectures. I think, I don't know, people found uh, like the Newcastle course or uh, the I think uh, the other course, what's, I have not read the book, what everyone reads. I can't even think of the name. Uh, there is a lecture course is uh, done uh, in which they will just teach you, which I think no one can put this much amount of knowledge into your brain, just you by listening. It's you who has to read. So I found both these courses very, very good. And then the other last three courses were towards the end of my preparation. Like Medway was five weeks before my exam. King's was three weeks before my exam. Norwich was two weeks before my exam. Excellent courses, all three of them. But all three, as I said, Medway, I sent my email to Paras, who organizes this course in October, saying that what are your dates for next year, March, April? I want to appear in April. And he said, not decided yet. And then after 15 days, I was the first person to go on that course for this course on 23rd of March. So well, six months in advance. 
and same with kings i teased the secretary who organized this course in 2018 and then secretary changed but this secretary passed over my name that this person is first i was second because my colleague from the same hospital he was first so i was the second person on the waiting list for this course to be held in april and we were on the waiting list from october 2018 and similarly with norwich course uh, like we had both applied in october 2018 so good courses will go early so you must must ace the organizers and get yourself a place 6 months in advance if you want to go on good courses course other courses will be available last minute but obviously if they have not filled up that means there are better courses available regarding the courses i will just say one thing uh, in uh, some of the courses like they are all very useful but some of the courses i found a bit of a bias between a trainee and a non trainee in the book but i must say that this is something which i learned from one of the coaching classes when i was appearing for for my plab exam and uh, this is a method of history taking i was taught for my plab and i applied the same for uh, the frcs as was suggested by one of my friends who passed in february till february i was i didn't have a set performer for history taking so i used to try to cover all the points individually for the each case is like spine case i will try to cover all points uh, uh, thinking okay what else can be important in spine and all that but often it used to lead that okay the examiner will say that oh you didn't ask smoking it was important in this case or you didn't ask the patient's expectations it was important so then my friend suggested me why don't you use that same performer we use for plab and that's this that's p3 maftosa i i find it easy to remember and recall because i had done it before for my plab uh, if people want to use it they can uh, i found it very helpful so p3 it stands for presenting complaints past history personal history in personal history mostly you ask like uh, smoking and alcohol then is your uh, medical history allergies family history treatment history occupation and social anything else so in uh, family history you will ask only when it is relevant so if you think that he, the the patient has some uh, genetic disorder autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive rheumatoid arthritis anything which you are aware can run in families you will ask but you will not ask a family history if it's a trauma chronic trauma case or something in which it is not relevant treatment history again like uh, you will not offer a patient a treatment which he's already had so if someone has had physiotherapy or someone has had injections for their back pain uh, you would not like to offer them the same treatment if that has not helped so treatment history is important to ask and in social history i used to ask the uh, activities of daily living like for your oxford hip score or oxford knee score if uh, like you want you don't have the time to ask all of them but at least you can ask okay can you manage stairs can you go up to the shops for your shopping and um, any other third question you can ask in social history that will cover okay you have asked how this hip arthritis is uh, functionally affecting this old lady so that i used to ask in social history and last anything else i used to just ask what is their expectations from this consultation which uh, i was taught is very important to ask uh, in intermediate cases so uh, last point is what is their expectation i used to just word it in this way if i was to make only one thing better what that one thing would be and they would tell me okay if you could take away my pain so at least they have stressed that pain is their main concern so i used to use it in that way and again like people would have seen it before in presenting complaint the most common symptom people will come with will be pain and like the questions for pain is socrates uh, many books have said it before but those who have not uh, heard it before socrates will stand for sight onset character not very important i found but radiation association timing exaggeration relieving factors and severity Uh, all relevant in individual cases like in case of a, a back pain and leg pain case you need to ask sight 
which is more bothersome, back or leg. And then you need to ask onset, how was the onset? Radiation, again, you need to ask, okay, if you're thinking hip pain or back pain, you need to ask whether it's going up to the knee or it crosses beyond the knee. So that all shows to the examiner that in your mind, you are thinking. You are making your differential diagnosis and you are ruling out one by one what is not there. Similarly, association, excuse me, uh, association, again, pain, if you are thinking in the lines of infection, septic, then you will ask for fever. If you are thinking in uh, the lines of uh, back pain, sciatica, you will ask in association with weakness, numbness, bowel, bladder symptoms. So obviously by that time, you should have some differential diagnosis and the association of all those differential diagnoses you will ask in your history. Timing I found very important for uh, tumors and infection, like you will ask night pain. It can tell you severity of osteoarthritis if it's night pain. It can tell you about tumors. It can tell you about infection if it is uh, like persistent non-mechanical pain even at night time. Again, like morning time pain, rheumatoid arthritis. So if it is relevant, you it's not that you have to cover all these points saying negative, like if it is not there, you're still saying that, oh, character is like this. Not like that. It's like a sieve, which will help you ask the relevant question of the differential diagnosis you have thought in your mind that I'm going towards this. Again, exaggerating relieving factors. You, If you have a differential, you ask specific exaggerating relieving factors. Okay, did this make better? Okay, if you are looking at a lumbar canal stenosis, did sitting down make it better? Did going uphill make it better or downhill make it worse? So the differential should be in your mind and your question should show the examiner that you are asking this question to rule out or you uh, like going towards one particular diagnosis. This was uh, another mnemonic for chronic cases like OD para again. I read, I found it from one of my coaching in lab and OD para is for chronic conditions. Like uh, if someone has a long standing back pain or if someone has a lump, then you ask the OD para history onset, duration and progression, whether it's rapidly progressive, gradually progressive, Association again, like if you think uh, it's a tumor, whether it's associated with other lumps and bumps in the body, any bleeding or orifices, loss of weight, night sweats. So again, your differential should be in your mind, but then association, this will just uh, let you ask the right questions. Ag relieving, aggravating factors, again, same. So OD para. And these were some of the modifications like uh, in the history taking I had prepared. Fortunately, I didn't have an intermediate pediatric case, but I thought in pediatrics often it will be a chronic issue. So presenting history, I will ask according to OD para. And then past history in peds often becomes the birth history of the child. So you will ask whether the child was born in term or like on term and whether there were any perinatal issues. So all the birth history will come become the P2 in pediatrics. And personal history, obviously, a child is, does not smoke and drink. So instead of that, personal history in children will become milestones. So depending on the age, you can ask whether they walked at what age did they walk, what age did they start talking, what age did they sit without support, stand without support. So P3 in pediatrics would have become milestones and rest everything would I would have left the same. As I said, fortunately, I didn't have a pediatric intermediate case, but that was my preparation. Similarly, I got a scoliosis case in my course in Stanmore, and I didn't ask that girl's menarche for which I failed. But then I made sure that for every other case I saw of scoliosis, P3, so presenting past, again, scoliosis, most common case will be a adolescent girl, 11, 12, she is most likely not smoking and drinking. So P3 I made for periods so that I never miss that again. And rest everything can be the same. And for upper limb case, I used to start always by age, handedness, and occupation. So in my language, aho means yes. So I had prepared myself that 
in my intermediate case, I would always start from a home. So I will start by history. Patient's age is often given in the letter, GP letter or small note given to you. But I would always start with their handedness and occupation. And that's only in one case. So when I was walking in the corridor towards my intermediate upper limb case, I was just saying in my mind, this is the case I have to ask, start with AHO nothing else like in no other case you need to ask a intermediate case history so only one case so i was just telling to myself start with aho i started with that so there is nothing to miss in that now two things from my exam what i felt i did not prepare very well was deformity and lumps like everyone reads the nick harris book prepares all the joints prepares for spine examination, prepares for peripheral nerve examination, prepares for brachial plexus examination. But these two things, it's not given specifically how to examine uh, in those books. So I felt this is uh, like can be a weak point if you are not well prepared for it. So for deformity, I got it in one of the course, like uh, a non-union of the tibia with a ring fixator. So I had for myself after that experience, I made, okay, the history is again OD para, that onset duration, progression, association, relieving, aggravating factors, anything else. But then for e examination, I made a code of LARA. So LARA stands for length, angulation, rotation, and association. So association can be stiffness, instability or neurology. So if you apply it for any deformity, it can be applied on that. But specifically, I used it for, as I will tell you later, on my intermediate lower limb case, which was a hypertrophic non-union of the tibia. So I asked, like, there is no specific examination technique, but I looked at these things. Is it shortened? Is it angulated? Is it rotated? Is it associated with stiffness of the knee or the ankle? Is it associated with instability? Is there any distal neurovascular deficit? So I think people can make it better if they find it in a good clinical examination book. They can even make it better. But that's what I came up with. And fortunately, this helped me pass my exam. And lumps, I had not prepared this. I have prepared it for this talk. Like uh, I was told in one of the courses that someone had got a soft tissue sarcoma of the thigh as their intermediate case. So again, uh, if you have prepared only the joint examination, you might not be very well prepared for uh, a lump examination. So I looked up uh, a good site about examination of a lump and I, I've just again... I love to make mnemonics, so if you find it helpful, you can use it. If you want to use your own, you are free to do that. But I found uh, that it can be uh, summarized to this, uh, that FRCS exam is basically from your ST3 to your CCT. So ST3 stands for site, size, and shape of the lump. So wherever the lump is, you will tell, okay, it's in the distal femur, and it's roughly of this size, and on feeling the shape, it is either smooth in shape or multi-lobulated or combination. Right, now coming to the actual exam ex experience. So Firaz, if you want to stop. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Ashish. So